It's the Daily Talk Show, episode 693. And joining us today, Shane Jacobson. Welcome to the show, mate. Thank you. How are we doing? <laughs> mate, mate, King how, Dad, how I've, got, uh, I've got my Mrs. Cup. Uh, I'm really <laughs> naughty. My wife's out. I do what I want. <laughs> Ironically, we both, this is not planned, we both have cups with crowns on them. Mine says, king of dad jokes, and I, I don't think that's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favourite dad joke at the moment, Shane? Uh, look, my favourite one uh, at the moment is two snakes uh, sliding through the grass together, uh, and one of them says, uh, are we poisonous? And the other one goes, uh, I don't know, why? And he goes, just think about it, are we poisonous? And he said, uh, no, we're not, why? And he goes, oh, thank God for that. He goes, why? He goes, I just bit my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. It's good, it's yeah, I, I find with, I find with, sorry, go on, Shay. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I just want to have a quick chat about dad jokes for a moment because yeah. I think dad jokes have been getting a really bad rap for way too long. And I'll tell you why I have an issue with it is because Everyone says, oh, that's a dad joke. And I have to explain, yeah, because I have four children and they're 14, 10, 8 and 5. And that's their actual names because I couldn't be asked naming them. <laughs> <laughs> they're children. And I have better jokes than the one about the snake, but I just can't say to my children, okay, there's this nun and a goat. There's a... <laughs> if anyone can think of a joke that ends with that. Actually, me and Stephen Curry used to play a game which was you had to come up with a punchline for a joke that doesn't exist and then see if anyone can. And and we never actually came up with the jokes, but we just loved the punchlines. And our favourite one was, yeah, well, it was a goat when I gave it to you. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Do you so think um, dad jokes, I've, I've kind of, I've tried to think of them in the moment, I mean, you're a you're a professional comedian. I'm just a gronk, but I find it hard to pull on dad jokes. But somehow, I find them in the moment. I think that's the essence of a dad joke, right? A true dad that doesn't know that he's being a dad and dad joking in the moment. Well, the reason they come easily is, the, and the reason people have an issue with them, I guess, is because they're low hanging fruit. Like it's the mm -hmm. first thought that comes to your mind, or the easiest gag you can come up with is a dad joke. And there are some that are kind of better dad jokes, you know, like, you know, the, you know, babushka dolls, you know, those babushka dolls. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't like them. Do you know why? Why? They're too full of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so that yeah, actually is a joke one. that, see, there you go. That's got a little punchline in it. But mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, dad jokes are the simplest low hanging fruit. But again, it's because it's normally set around children where you can't be, doing the jokes you want to do. I mean, I do, and I as mean, a result, my kids get expelled a lot. But. <laughs> <laughs> they're, um, I think they're clever. Like, I think they're looking at what people are observing in the moment. And and so, and so, what do you think? Do you think their dad jokes are clever, even though they are first thought? No, they're not. They're not clever. They're, just, they're safe <laughs> fodder. <laughs> that's, that's all it is. It's a real dad thing so, to say, wasn't it? Sorry. <laughs> it's just you don't want to get you don't want to have docs turn up at your front door going. We uh, believe you told the one goat joke to your four year old. <laughs> I'm not think, sure if anyone knows like, that joke. Do you like small talk, Shane? I've built a career on it. <laughs> 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 Uneducated. <laughs> unfactual small talk is that yeah. emceeing because i feel like that's um like you've done so much emceeing and speaking mm. is, is that a lot of it um i think so number one they give you you know if you're doing an awards night um and they're not always as much fun for anyone really as they say there's only one thing better than an awards night and that's the end of one um <laughs> and that but so people there, the thing that's exciting for anyone there is people who are genuinely um, in with a chance of winning an award get to dress up and not everyone gets the joy of going to a nice ballroom dressed up with their wife or partner or friends. Um, you know, usually the drinking booze, the drinking food is all, all free, the food and bev. So they're up for a few drinks, they get a nice meal and they're out with a whole bunch of friends and they might win an award. The second and I always get asked at awards nights, and I quite often joke, but I always get asked, or if not always, often enough, to mention the fact that just by being there at the awards night and being a nominee, you're all, in fact, winners. And I always say, that's bullshit. <laughs> um, because 
in a minute, we're about to find out exactly who won. And if your name doesn't get mentioned, you've absolutely lost this sucker um, because you just weren't good enough and you've got a year to get your shit together. Um, so, the, But the truth is the room starts usually pretty good. They, one, have more alcohol and that obviously increases their volume. And then after that, once they've realised they have or haven't won, either way, if they've won, they've got something to celebrate and they don't have to listen anymore. And if they haven't, they've got something to commiserate. And either way, they're drinking and they're making more noise. So it actually changes through the night. You start just, you know, formalities. Thank everyone for coming. It's great to be here. Uh, you know, let's hear from the general manager. Let's hear from the CEO. A couple of words from our sponsors. Got to thank our sponsors, who without we couldn't do tonight. They're all exactly the same at these events. Or near enough to. And then after that, um, it becomes crack a few jokes in between the awards. And then after that, it becomes a fist fight of words uh, in an attempt to capture their attention. And by the end, it's the LA rights of 92. <laughs> I'm hoping you can make me feel better. Um, so yesterday we had our accountant uh, on the show giving us sort of um, uh, tips on business and finance. And when uh, I introed him... I panicked and in the moment I said the wrong business name. I said a completely different business name that he was from. I was hoping that maybe given that you're a professional, maybe throughout your career you've had an absolute massive fuck up that you could share to make me feel better based on saying something you shouldn't have said as an MC. No, it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a lie right there. Um, so, oh, look, we've all done it. Um, but, but you don't have to feel as bad because you only did it to an accountant. And as we know, <laughs> they, they use their personality as a contraceptive. Um, <laughs> no, that's the odyssey. There you go. There's, there's one of the we oldest We actually have a book. really a hot and likable accountant. It's a, it's a, rare, it's a rare breed. <laughs> yeah. he's, a, he's actually yeah, yeah. more charming than us. It's pretty annoying. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, well, I, 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 I'm not here to judge or qualify or quantify whether my accountant is hot or not. Um, <laughs> that was my next question. It's a weird muscle to flex that thought. <laughs> um, I've had, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, so I'll tell you some of that in no particular order, although they, they do tend to come out in order of, of the ones that are most memorable, therefore probably the worst. So stuff ups, people I've forgotten to thank. Here's the one, when, when, when I won an AFI award, um, for the film Kenny, I did a film called Kenny, which is like 14, 15 years ago now. Um, uh, I got up on stage. Now, my, I thanked everyone, the people that wrote the music, um, people who, who uh, you know, came and drove a truck for 15 minutes. The only people I forgot to thank was the investor that paid for the entire film. <laughs> Uh, just, just omitted Glenn Pruska from Splashdown, the company, in fact, that gave us full access to their company for two years and and the film was about the company and he paid for the whole film. Didn't thank him. Didn't think that. Done it, I didn't think that through. It's just the time got away and I had that nervous moment where I'm like, I think I've spoken too long, which is not a thought I often have, but on this day I did. And then... Um, the only other person I didn't thank, which probably doesn't matter, I suppose, it's just my brother who directed and wrote the <laughs> film with me and produced it, who was the creative genius behind the entire existence uh, of Kenny. So there's that. There's one, Josh. Yeah. Um, uh, in the film, Kenny, in the credits of the film, Kenny, uh, my best mate's father, who uh, tragically, we only, I want to mention his name because we only lost him a few weeks ago, Des Lawton, who was like another father to me, um, and uh, he, he works for a company... Uh, called Show Effects, and they did all the pyro uh, for the film for free. Um, th their competitor back in the day, I'm not sure how severe or existent that competitive um, battle between them is these days, um, but they had a company called AV Effects, and I have no idea why. But when I was uh, writing all the credits out to give to my brother oh, no. to include in the film, I listed their name in the credits and I was sitting at the premiere with all the people from Show Effects. <laughs> no, that's worse. And that's as worse. I'm sitting there, it went past on, the, as you know, you put them in the credits, they're that small on a television, they're a stick of your finger. On a movie screen when you're sitting down the front, that word is like 20 feet wide. <laughs> and as, as the letters... AV effects 
go past. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and it never oh occurred to me until it went past me. And I'm like, oh, oh. shit. <laughs> And I, and I could hear from behind me. So. <laughs> what do you do? Are you someone to sort of lean into that and have the hard conversation or apologize instantly? What do you do? I, like all of us, being a human, it's a mixture of all of them. You overcompensate. You talk about it like wait for way too long. Um, you, you stutter. Um, you never start the sentence the way it should be. Um, you just go, look, you know, <laughs> you should never start a sentence with look a because look means, <laughs> it, it means I don't, I don't fucking care what you think. This is what happened. <laughs> and, and I went, look, I remember, I still remember going, look, and, and that just sounded like you bet you have to forgive me. I don't care what you think. I was just, it was so bad. And, and you know what made it worse is they were so okay about it, which of course made me feel worse. Mm-hmm. Um, so no, I reacted terribly and mentioned it every time I saw them until they said, you have to stop talking about it because we don't think about it until every time we see you when you bring it up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, problem, Shane, we've, we, we've talked about a few things, uh, um, emceeing, cinemas, these things uh, not happening at the moment. How has is, how is what's going on at the moment affected your corner of the world and, and the work you do day to day? Uh, it's affected it in a couple of small ways. Um, I no longer have a job. <laughs> um, m- my income has been reduced uh, slightly by 100%. Um, <laughs> it's, not funny. It's, not, it's, it's not funny, but it's just how you say it. <laughs> I'm now a... Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, um... My children uh, now have to stare at an unemployed bum in their house. Um, I was a bum when I was employed. It's just now I'm an unemployed bum. No, look, the, um, uh, it's obviously it, it grounds to a halt. Um, having, having said that, there's things I'm working on, which is a, a, a documentary on the collapse of the Westgate Bridge, which at the moment I'm self-funding, so that's, um, that's interesting when there's no well, funds coming years. in. Happy birthday because it's you turned 50 last mm. month. And so it was yeah. 50 years ago that um, the Westgate Bridge collapse happened? Yeah, 15th of October uh, this year will be its 50th um, anniversary. And, and for those that don't know, it, it was the largest um, and still is the largest industrial accident ever to have happened in Australia. And 35 men on that day lost their lives um, in an instant. And so, um, yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a thing that I've, I've, I've been... Um, passionate about commemorating a lot of people. Um, number one, I'm from the western suburbs of Melbourne. Um, it was a, a working class and a migrant trophy when that was being built, um, literally because the people who build cities are the working class. And I've just always had had this thing that whenever I mention the Westgate Bridge, I just always assumed. Um, I've always known it was the year that I was born was the same year that so many died. And and, and again, being from the western suburbs, this Westgate Bridge. Um, that, that linked the west, you know, the working class western suburbs with, with more affluent sort of eastern suburbs. Um, this thing was like, you know, the, the, the joining of the working class, uh, the white collar and the blue collar worker. So I always saw it as a, a monument of great loss, but also a great achievement for the, for the working class. And I would so mention it a bit because I had a mate who once said, and I don't even know why I've always had this thing about the Westgate Bridge, but you know, he said, "Oh, the Story Bridge in Brisbane is as big as it." And I said, "Oh, oh the Tower Bridge he was talking about." And I. I said, no, it's not. And he said, oh, I think you'll find it's, it's bigger than the Westgate. And I said, no, no, it's not. And he said, well, do you want to make a bet? And I said, oh, yeah, what do you want to bet? He said, oh, slab of beer. I said, yeah, all right, we'll go a slab of beer. So I won that bet by a kilometre. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, see, it's a good bridge. Um, so it won, me, it won me a slab of beer and I've never I've felt like I've owed the bridge something ever since. But um, anyway, it, it, the, every time I would mention the Westgate Bridge for whatever reason, over – not, not all the time, but periodically over 50 years, people would say, oh, I, oh, what was that? I didn't know it fell. Or that's the one with the car hanging off the end. I'd go, no, that was the one in Tassie. And I was kind of amazed how many people weren't really aware of the collapse of the Westgate Bridge. So anyway, um, I, I'm, I'm still doing a documentary on that. Um, but to go back to your question about how much it's affected me, yeah, the entire industry has, um, you know, has literally had the handbrake pulled on um, without us sort of being aware. Of course, we're all aware of what's going on with the coronavirus, but yeah, the handbrake got pulled on pretty quick. Um, <clears throat> so anything anything I do for the most part involves dragging a crowd there. And of course, that's the thing we can't do. So, um, but I, you know, the thing that there's, um, as you know, a lot of people turn to entertainers 
um, in times of tragedy. So, and, and now is no different. It's just the difference is we're in the tragedy that we're a part of trying to make people feel good about. But the thing is, we I, I just don't feel I can complain because there are so many people, so many people in exactly the same position who aren't entertainers. So, so we're, you know, I mean, we've heard of the million times. We're all in this together. And it is true. It's just that we're all in something together that's quite shit ass. Um, so but, we, uh, when... Um, when you were starting out, like I think about a friend of mine who was living in LA, he just went back to do another sort of stint there at pushing for a show that he's trying to get up and he's since moved back, which like puts a big full stop in the current journey to try and make it, right? Yeah. You know, thinking about all the people that, are, you know, vying to do what you've done, um, what about you in the early days? What do you think you would have done in a time like this as a young entertainer? Oh look, I'm I'm, uh, I'm a little bit more nuts and bolts, I guess. I I'm, I've always been. A, I've had another life, a few other lives. Like I've I've actually in the last five weeks started up a transport and logistics company with some of the trucks I've got. So um, instead of waiting tables, I, I was a lighting. So I was a lighting designer, a lighting operator. I ran a lighting company. I was national general manager for a lighting company for 13 years. So you know, I put lighting crew out on tours with. Tina Arena and I worked on, I was a pyrotechnician for Guns N' Roses and Bon Jovi and ACDC and all that. So uh, I had a book called The Long Road to Overnight Success because I worked so many jobs where I, I literally, uh, so whenever there, I, I kind of always have to work on that kind of personality. Mm. You know, even my wife laughed at me recently when I, before um, BC, before Corona, um, <laughs> I, I said, it, you know, things will calm down one day. It'll get quieter. And she laughed and said, oh, sweetheart, you're, that's never going to happen with you. You just won't let it happen. I, I've loved, I've, I've loved being busy doing lots of things. So even when acting didn't happen, I've, it wasn't like I was the person that sat around going, Oh bugger! I can't act. I would just do other things, which is produce or write um, or develop. You know, even now I'm developing stuff that will happen once the world's allowed to catch up close to other humans again. You know, so but but to answer so to answer your question, I would have I just I instantly just find something else to do because I have to be busy. You know, um, but that may not help anyone listening who goes, well, what am I supposed to do? But now is a good chance to um, think at expanding your your knowledge base of entertainment so there are online courses um you know get online and google what you know what is a line producer versus a producer um you know how do you put together a film budget or you know watch other performances watch online acting classes um or start to write your own material have a go at writing read other scripts and have a look at how they formulate them so um i, I see downtime as time to pick something else up um don't you know what do they say don't don't Make the time count. Don't count the time as it goes by. You know, so mm. that that's how I would do it. Yeah. The um on the the lighting technician stuff. Have you seen on YouTube the video oh, of you from nineteen ninety four <laughs> as the sales manager and lighting technician at Premier Lighting? <laughs> Uh, you're going to say with my mullet, aren't you, Josh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't put it on there because of copyright, but you guys, you've got to search Shane Jacobson no, 1994 no, no. into YouTube. I I don't think it can be done for copyright because <laughs> I did that gig for nothing and it keeps turning up. <laughs> it, oh, it, was for, it was for a government. Yeah, it, it was, was a government great. training thing. Well, it was great because you um, <laughs> you look so different, but you've got the exact same voice. It's it's <laughs> it's a, actually a beautiful piece of art. I loved it. I watched it last night. It was great. That was uh, yeah. That was before I could afford to eat properly. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, looked, it looked great. But no, I think like I mean, it's a good point in regards to you have done the whole crew stuff. The like you you've worked all those different roles. Obviously, with everything that's happening and what the government's sort of providing, there is that missed bit within entertainment. Is there an easy way to get around, get around that stuff? Like for people who go from doing one TV show to a, to another, is there a good solution? Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, entertainment. I can't help but compare it to sport quite often, um, only because it's an easier analogy. Which is, it, so often people do say, you know, I've got a, a son or a daughter or, or a friend who wants to be an actor, which they do. And it's similar to if someone says, I've got a son or a daughter who wants to, um, you know, play professional golf or be a professional footballer or, or soccer player or netball player, whatever it may be. 
And the answer is always the same. Motor car racing is the same, is you just have to do it over and over and over and over and over. To act naturally in front of a camera is a very unnatural act. And, and if, it was, if it was football, for instance, just to pick a, pick a sport, um, everyone says, you know, you know what, can you, what can my son do to, to, to get into a professional team? And, and the answer is, if they're not out in a field kicking a ball every single day, handballing with both hands, kicking with both feet, and, you know, you know, everyone's heard the Don Bradman stories of he was a great batsman because he used to hit mm. a golf ball against the corrugated metal tank with a, with a stump. So by the time someone bowled a massive cricket ball at him when he had a whole bat in his hand, he couldn't help but hit it. So that's it. There's, there's no, everyone goes, what's the secret? And you go, well, that's it. There's no secret. You just mm. have to, you got to, and everyone goes, well, what sort of performances should I be doing? And the answer is everything. Get up and bask. Is there any everything. stability in it or do you just have to accept the fact that it is, uh, you know, a, a mix yeah, it's no stability. It's like wanting to be a famous painter. You have to paint, just paint and paint and paint, and no one's going to pay you for those paintings for a long while until they start to get good. Um, but that's why you'd better love it, and that's the same as sport. You can you can train for 20 years to, to get into an AFL team, and the first day you go out, they get knocked to the ground, and they can snap your Achilles, and you're off the field again for for a year, you know. Yeah, um, it, 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 yeah so it's not – It's if you're looking for stability – um, uh, maybe drive through the town of entertainment and <laughs> keep going to proper career. <laughs> well, if you, if you drive a truck in entertainment, you will get mentioned in your speech. <laughs> so that's a good way of doing it. Yeah, yeah well, come, well and, think- come and work for me <laughs> with FTA Transport <laughs> Logistics. I think, um, you know, speaking with lots of people and hearing different stories, there's always the part of the story that is the pain so you mentioned an artist and it could be the point where they're feeling so much pain about not having achieved or left their little studio and that's when it starts to turn in your career i mean has there have you felt that have you felt like god this isn't going anywhere and it's been in that moment where you've found the gold which is very annoying because it's painful right (laughs) Yeah, well, it, I was th- I was thirty six until I had the thing that people remembered me for. So, and I'd been trying, you know, every week before that. So, you know, I started performing at eight. Um, actually, it was quarter past eight. Um, <laughs> no, it's a very bad gig. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> so the uh, you yeah, know around about eight was when I actually started performing, and then it took me you know until I was thirty six until it until people started to, like I said, until I was considered an actor or even remotely considered an actor. Um, but that's why I, I, used to, I did amateur theatre for 13 years and sang in bands and did stand-up and all that kind of stuff and, and did warm-up for TV stations. The thing is, you have to love it. You really do. Like racing car drivers, you know, again, I always go back to sport. I mean, they love driving a car. They, you know, their dream is to do their hobby professionally and if people are going in acting just to give acting a crack, it's, it's going to be a hard journey. But standing up in front of an audience and getting paid or not getting paid, you enjoy it the same. I've, I love doing amateur theatre. I loved it and, and don't have more fun now being paid to do it. So you're right. Was there a moment? There's not a singular moment, but there was a billion moments when you're like, man, I mm. so wish I could do this full time. And, you know, I used to watch, you know, I used to want to be able to, go on the Don Lane show when I was like a kid and, and think, gosh, you know, I wish I was able to go on Hey Hey at Saturday, you know, watch Shane Bourne and Murray Field, bloody Murray Field and Shane Bourne uh, and just think, I, you know, imagine if I could get to the point that I could go on TV and tell jokes, how cool would that be, you know? So there's it was, it was just a collection of a million moments of wanting to keep doing whatever it took to get there. But I, I've always said you have to love the journey. If you're only focused on the destination, um, yeah, you, you know, being on a plane, going to a holiday, if you're going to Paris for a holiday, I mean, everyone's excited the whole way on that flight. Just have a champagne and all. They're strapped to a chair. I'll be going to Paris because they're excited about what it might be. So I always say if you can enjoy that time on the plane as well as when you get to Paris, you're going to enjoy two more days of a two-week holiday, you know. So you've got to enjoy the process, I think. Uh, you're a rev head, Shane. Uh, Holden obviously announced their bi- big news of shutting the doors. Is it the end of the year or when, when's that actually officially happening? <clears throat> well, it's kind of been happening for years depending mm. on how you feel about it. So the name Holden will cease to exist as a badge, but as you know, they stopped manufacturing Holdens uh, a while ago. You know, it's been over a year. So for die diehard fans, um, so for anyone who doesn't care about motoring, I've always 
you can go to music for this one is my analogy or sport so <clears throat> yes they have been manufacturing western bulldog jumpers for a while but the team hasn't run out on the field for over a year and a half with if you as a holden analogy but I've, I've always said the people who don't get um why why motoring fans are so you know kind of devastated if you will because it is it is devastation for motoring fans that <clears throat> imagine if you got you know one music fans one day when the last Beatle has passed away and you realise you can go and listen to their old albums, but you can never see them or hear them live again. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, and imagine for football fans, if they said, oh, you can still run around in a jumper that you purchased for, you know, Collingwood um, five years ago, but the team doesn't exist anymore. They're making no more new jumpers and you can never see a new Collingwood team walk out on a field. Like people would go, oh, so that's what happened. Yes, Holden's are still on the road um, and I've got quite a, quite a few old ones. I collect old cars. Having said that, I've been blamed for the collapse of Holden because my wife, as a surprise for my 50th, brought me a ZD Fairlane 500, which was a car that turned 50 this year, as do I, and it's a Ford that I've always loved and she purchased me that as a surprise and it got delivered, and a week and a half later, Holden announced they were no longer going to make, well, no longer exist. And my friends said, "You brought one Ford." <laughs> <laughs> I'm to blame, apparently. That's it. I mozzed it. Uh, what what sort of cars? Like, so uh, first of all, I want to know what cars you have. But second of all, then what licenses you have? Because I remember chatting <laughs> to you and name and you named all the different types of licenses you have. You have a very good memory, Josh. This is the problem when you've got friends like Josh who remember everything you say. Um, oh, well, well, this is what we're talking about, stuff that, that you remember that people say. Do you remember where I buried that body from that night we had? <laughs> yeah, I think it was it was under the West Gate, wasn't it? Just, no. Yeah, everything every goes there. Hence <laughs> the fact it's on my radar. Yeah. Um, uh, so licenses, yeah, so I've got a, I've got a motorbike, uh, I've got car, I've got bus, I've got... Uh, Semi license, so that's um, you can drive heavy, rigid, and articulated semis, um, forklift, scissor lift, boom lift, um, jet ski, boat. I think that's them. Yeah. And you've scissor, got scissor, scissor, and then, then you've also got uh, your pyrotechnics license. You? I've, I have the ability to blow things up, um, which the licensing is a separate part of. <laughs> 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 one is the permission to do so, and one is the passion to want to blow things up. Yeah, so I did. Did that. I had that for a while. I think that's all probably lapsed now, the pyro mm -hmm. stuff. But uh, cars, yeah, I've got a, a – so E.H. Uh, e. Holden has always been my, my dream car. So I've got a 1964 E.H. Holden. Um, I did a film with Paul Hogan called Charlie and Boots, and in that film was a H.J. Kingswood that I purchased after we finished um, filming that. So that's been restored and lives at the Holden Museum in Echuca. Um, I've got a HQ Ute that's been restored, um, and uh, I've got a Morris 1100. Um, which is for my wife. It's being restored at the moment. The ZD Fairlane, and then I've got my daily drives in it. I've got a Toyota Land Cruiser Ute, just because you've got to have a Land Cruiser Ute. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like these cars are, are actual, are actually functional. Maybe you might have an insight, but I used to live in Shepparton, and you drive, you know, through the sort of country towns, uh, you know, around and. It's it almost came hand in hand to have a paddock <laughs> and a fuckload of cars that are broken and in the paddock. For one, what are they doing in there, and why are people you know why are people getting so many broken cars in a paddock? Um, like that, uh, I'm with you. It doesn't quite make sense. All of mine do run, and as soon as I <laughs> as soon as I get them, yeah, it'd be like having a fridge full of food and not eating it. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Everything comes back eventually to a food analogy you'll find. I give up on sport and I always end up back at food. Um, you know, it might all work. Uh, a lot of people used to do it because they get them because, you know, they go, I'm going to fix that car one day and then that would cost money so they wouldn't do it. And then someone else would go, I've got this other car I can get for 300 bucks," And you go, oh, yeah, I'll grab that. I'm going to fix that one day and you just don't. Some people do it because they want to keep them for parts. I'm partly guilty every time offers me – anytime someone offers me a part of something – that's a car that I've got, you can't help but go, maybe I do need a spare set of rims. And you think at the point you've damaged all four of your rims, you've probably ridden the car off. You probably <laughs> don't. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, but I, look, you do have paddock, paddock bombs. I've actually also got a, a VS Commodore a Ute V8 that I have as a rally car. So that I do have a few spare bits for that because that that's probably going to go wrong because I do a bit of rallying as well. And that going through trees tends to go bad at some point. 
you, do you think you that you're good bus, at finishing? Oh, what were you going to say, TJ? Uh, have you still got your bus, the big bus yes, I did. that you were driving yes. around? I do have a, I do have a bus, which is a, a you know, haven't you got one? <laughs> uh, I thought everyone had a bus. Yeah, now now I've got now I've got four trucks. So that's yeah, that's getting four trucks and four refrigerated delivery vans. What was the thinking behind the trucks? Quick, like, are you someone to buy the trucks and then then work out the business model, or did you have the business model first? Yes and no. So yes to half of that, and yes to the other half, <clears throat> being that I had I have a, I have a company called um, Film Trucks Australia. So. Um, I have, it's a big commercial kitchen in, a, in the back of a truck that does catering for film and TV. So, you know, things like Neighbours and things like that, and even even down to feeding Katy Perry's crew when she played at Bright and our truck was used to, a chef for Elton John used it to cook for him and then the crew for <clears throat> Queen were then fed by my truck. So it turns up to locations um, with this huge big kitchen in the back of it. And then I have a green room truck, which is... Um, Actors can use that to sit in. It has a toilet and a shower and a couch and a, a little desk there for them to pre- read their scripts on and stuff. So I had those two trucks, and then uh, when coronavirus hit, I had I have a mate Dave Pittman who has a trucking company, and we had two other. He he has quite a few trucks, but we had two trucks sitting there that we were going to sell or convert into maybe green rooms or something else. And then when coronavirus hit, we realised rather than change them, they are a, a load carrying truck. They're twenty six and a half ton. 16 pallet tort liners there you go so um so we uh we've got those on the road now and but that bits the so the other bits were have an idea and then buy the trucks and now with those other trucks i've got those just got them registered in the last few weeks and then we're now trying to build expand a business with them so half of them had a plan and the other one it's so one was the was the chicken first and the other one was the egg first <laughs> well it's, i mean it sounds pretty entrepreneurial in in terms of business sense how have you taken a an entrepreneurial business approach to your career in entertainment i i i probably always have one thing i've i've known i've been lucky to have a brother and still have a brother who's you know a director he's a writer he's a producer um so i've always known that entertainment is an industry and and the one thing that i've also always known um is that it's called show business and business is a far bigger word than show um because shows will show but the business is what will kind of help you in the end i think so um i've always liked so i produce as well um which i i get a kick out of i I, i've always liked the running of an event so i used to be an, an event manager as well and i did site management for you too and used to build events so I used to design the lighting sound security plans i used to come up with security plans for security companies for at a major event and then design the stage and the power and power distribution and all that kind of stuff and i've always loved that i love the you know i love you know it's kind of if you like lego it's kind of an extension of that in my mind like building big events and then packing them up so i've always loved the back end of both sides of the lens and both sides of the curtain and I've, I've been a, a venue manager at the Palais Theatre. I was the house tech there, and and that's where I learned all my lighting and sound skills. So I've loved mm. the the building of something, um, the putting it together and pulling it apart. So so does that make me entrepreneurial? I don't know, but I've always known the business side of it. Understanding, truly understanding, if you're going to get a contract um, to read as an actor, it's nice to know what that contract means. And when I turn up. The thing I, that I, and you know, if anyone listening to this and watching this has something to take away from this, I'll tell you something I figured out a really long while ago, which was that people are so interested to tell you what they know. And if they're a mechanic and you go, how does an engine work? If you meet anyone when you go to a wedding or a mate's place or you know, a friend of yours has a new boyfriend or a girlfriend or a new partner and, and you go, what do you do? And they go, I'm a mechanic. If you say to them, how does an engine work? They'll tell you because they're about, they'll be really happy to share their knowledge. And honestly, I think eight out of 10 people would do it in the olden days. You know, in some ways people might, you know, might go if you, someone might go, oh, I'm not telling you that or don't be stupid. But honestly, I reckon it's worth continuing to ask those questions because if you go up to a lighting guy in a theatre, if you're, if you're in a theatre as an actor and you stand beside one of the lighting crew and go, what does that light do? They'll tell you. They will tell you. And I spent years driving people mad with questions. And in the end, 
um, I, I, I became a blotting designer and that was, I, I, there's no course for it. In fact, in the end, I became a lecturer at a university for a short stint on entertainment lighting and, that, and I'd never done a course myself and I'm standing there lecturing in it. But it was because I just asked so many questions, you know. Peter Brock didn't go to race driver school. He just drove a car around a paddock and asked people questions about cars and learnt on the fly until he got great at it. What's a new skill that you've uh, picked up recently, Shane? Oh, what's a new skill? Oh, well, this last week we, we planted a veggie garden. So me and my wife have been online and looking at when you plant certain vegetables. And so I've built <clears throat> a, uh, a, a rather large veggie garden. So... I'm now finding out about that, and you're supposed to build a um, a net over them so that the birds don't get to them. But what they hadn't told warned us about is maybe one of our three dogs might find the veggie garden interesting. Oh, <laughs> and they're bigger annoying. than a bird. Just, just sniffing <laughs> and digging. What <laughs> annoying! Well, because we put the, this thing called three-way mix, which is a really good soil mix, of which it has some manure in it. Not mine yet, but <laughs> someone's. I, I imagine it's animals, um, and um, and of course the smell was pretty enticing to our. We've got we always have. I don't know why we have to have a lot of dogs. We've got you know three dogs, and our youngest dog, which is only a pup, it's only about three months old, just went wow, that smells amazing. We turned around and he was running all over the thing, and yeah, digging because it smelled like there was something alive in there, but there wasn't. There was dead humans or dead animals' feces in it. <laughs> Not a dead <laughs> animal species. Dead. You've um, we we learned the other day done. that um, potatoes come as a potato and you plant the potato. I didn't know that. Uh, Sevs, have you got your potatoes yet? We've got the potatoes. We haven't planted them yet. No. Okay. So why are you going to just eat them eventually? Well, we got to fill the planter boxes up. So we we got to buy heaps of soil. It okay. takes a lot of. So soil. do they just look like potatoes then? Yeah. Okay. Shane, did you plant Any, potatoes? Yeah. No, because I think you uh, see, so this is the new newly acquired skill. I think you've got to wait until um, November, I think is the best time. And they say, I think it's the, <laughs> after the Melbourne Cup, they reckon is a good time to do potatoes. But yeah, you do, what you've got to do with the potatoes when they go old, you'll see they start to sprout, you know, mm -hmm. a little greeny bit will poke out the top. And that's the point when you go, wow, that potato's a bit old, I should throw that away. Well, you can throw it away or you plant that potato. But what you can do is you can cut them up into, if there's a few sprouts coming out, you can actually sort of cut them and as long as it's got a bit of a sprout and plant those, and yes, they will grow into yeah. potatoes. Okay. So what, what did you end up growing? What did you end up like? What did the dog actually ruin the whole thing? Yeah, what and did what the did dog you plant? <laughs> yeah, the, um, we ended up growing a, a, a dissatisfied uh, family and a really happy dog. <laughs> 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 no, 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 we're, no, we're good. The, it didn't destroy everything. Um, uh, so we've got, um, we've got carrots. Uh, we've got beetroot, we've got onion, we've got garlic, um, we have broccoli, um, we have uh, silver beet, uh, we have cos lettuce, we have assorted lettuce. Um, yeah, it's a bit there. Mm. And we've got a Sony Bravia. <laughs> um, because I, I just realised you just shove stuff in the ground and whatever you put in there, multiples come out. And I had an old TV. So I've shoved that in the ground and, I don't know, hopefully out of that will come, I don't know, four TVs. I don't know if that helps. Maybe a 4K. Yeah, but a 1080 if you put enough uh, water on it. Um, um, Shay, what have you learned in this? T I mean, there's more downtime than most have. I know you sort of get to work when there's nothing to do, but is there anything you've sort of realised or focused on uh, or uh, having more downtime that's forced upon you? Oh, look, the, the absolute um, silver lining of this is I've, I've, I've got children um, and and I'm fortunate enough to still be with a woman that I am madly in love with. So I get to be at home with my best mate who happens to be my wife and my kids. So homeschooling, you know, I love those jokes going around at the moment that um, if homeschooling continues, they're pretty sure a parent will find the cure for coronavirus before the scientists do, just, <laughs> just to get the kids back to school. But um, having a chance to be at home with the kids every single day, we, we've, over Easter, we camped. I'm lucky to be on property. We've got six acres um, up in the Macedon Ranges. So we, you know, light, lit fires, we do marshmallows. Um, I've set up tents. We camped out for Easter. Um, you know, they, we've planted the veggie garden together and... I just we light fires every night, but either outside or inside. Last night we hope to catch the meteor shower, and because I'm not 
on, at airports or on planes anywhere near as much as I'm normally. Um, we sat outside last night. I made them cups of peppermint tea and we sat on the back steps and looked at the sky for, you know, an hour and stuff like that that mm. you don't normally get to do. So uh, what I love about it is it has reset. Um, but I'm not taking away from the fact that there are a lot of people suffering terribly during this time. Mm. But the, but what we're discussing is what is the good for me that has come out of it. As you said, I'm just making sure that, you know, I'd, I'd hate to think there's people listening to this going, well, that all sounds great, but my life's going to shit, which is, I'm sure it is for so many, and it is. But, again, going back to the silver linings, just being um, told I have to stay home with my wife and children um, means I'm doing that and that bit I'm loving. And my kids have, mm. you know, every, every night we joke, God, it's nearly every night, I go, kids, when you wake up in the morning, uh, I won't be here. I've got to go to the airport and I'm flying to Sydney and I'll be gone for a week. And they go, nah, you know, because they've heard that like so many times, I won't be here when you get here in the morning, I'll be gone for a few days, but I'll be back on Friday night. Um, and we joke about it now. I keep saying it and they'll wait for me to finish and go, no, you'll be here. You know, so for us, it's that novelty's never going to wear off. So that that's my takeaways. And I, we're filming my kids. They, I'm doing a little doco for our own family to document what they're doing during ISO so that when they're older, they can show their kids, you know. And I'm hoping they'll think it was a special time. But it is for me and my wife, it is, and we hope it is for our kids. Because you, um, you travel more than anyone, I think, I know. Like the how many... Like in a in a single year, do you know how many kilometres you're flying? I don't know how many kilometres. Uh, last year I did. So last year I did over two hundred flights, um, and I'm you know with Qantas I've made something like three and a half or four million frequent flight points or something. And everyone goes, that sounds great. It's like no, because I'm stuck on those planes to do it. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm you know I'm platinum with both airlines. And, yeah. You know, so. Um, yeah, I, I know I did, yeah. I, I did over 200 flights mm. last year. Um, so, yeah, I've got, you know, God, if you name the hotels, if you name a if you name a state or a city, I can tell you the hotels and which are the best rooms. Just, to, you know, I've got, I've got in Sydney, I've got certain venues where I say, you know, can I have a room 505, please, because it's mm. the better room. I know because I've stayed in half the rooms. Yeah, a lot of actors are the same, you know, there's a lot of people the same, but I do because of my type of work that I'm not on a network every single night. I I do fly, you know, quite often, you know, three states a, a week, you know. Do you think it'll be hard getting back to to that normal or do you think that all this calibration has maybe changed what you're going to do forever? I don't know. You know, a mate of mine said it best when he said there's two kind of people in the world at the moment. Um, there's those um, who don't know um, what the world would look like after coronavirus, and then there are those who are liars. Yeah. <laughs> no one knows. I mean, we've not yeah. done this. We've not yeah. done this in a modern in a modern area. We've not had coronavirus in the year twenty twenty before. Um, so I don't know what it would look like. I think I'm gonna. It's going to be harder for me to leave the house. It's been getting harder anyway because the older your kids get, you know, the more you're aware that they get old so quick. It's it's you know it's a cliche, and as we know, cliche means. It's something that has been proven to be right every single time throughout history. So I've always known that they do grow up quick, but um, I will find it harder to leave because I'm loving, you know, helping them school and read books with them every day. And yeah. we have breakfast every morning together. Every morning we get together and we all have breakfast. And every night we sit down and we have dinner together. You know, we, you know, we go, we're watching, you know, Hamish with Lego Masters at the moment and the kids are loving that and we sit down and, you know, we've got a schedule you know, of what we do as a family. So, yeah, that, that would be hard to walk away from. Mm. When I say walk away from, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, having some momentum within a career can, you know, if, it, I don't know if it's just like the thought that you have the momentum or if it's a real thing. Where have you placed momentum within your life? And, and I guess this is the moment where momentum is slowing based on something being enforced <clears throat> like this. That's the only reason it is guilt-free for me is because I'm being told to stay at home. Um, <clears throat> I don't. I, I've, I've still got bills to pay, um, and you know, we all, all, everyone's life is different. I've, um, through circumstance, I haven't got all the money I've made, um, so um, I, I still have debts to pay. I've got a full-time staff that, that work for me within my businesses, so um, <clears throat> there's reasons why I've always sort of trying to keep moving forward. But I've always felt like I'm supposed to go and achieve more. And and <clears throat> don't get me wrong, if once I've got 
you know, what I need to survive, I'm more than happy to stop. And I probably will. I'll, I'll really come back off the throttle, so to speak. Um, but there's just been reasons. There's been reasons in life, you know. I've, I've, I've been through a, a breakup and things like that where you go, okay, well, you know, you, things get separated and you start again. So I've, I've, had to, I've been through all that. <clears throat> and um, But I... The thing that's so normally I do wake up with a sense that I should be achieving something. I, I can't. I'm trying to shake that. I spent a life um, trying to build, you know, boy from the western suburbs, trying to make a career, and you can't help but go. I should do that because that would be good. That might lead to this, and I should go and work for that guy just to prove myself to him. And and I always try and uh, deliver on every promise. I that's my my dad set that up pretty early that your word is your bond, and without it, you're nothing that you, you sacrifice uh, n nothing to erase or damage the reputation of our family, which is we do what we say. We have to, we've got to do what we promise, and, you know, pretty much at all costs. Um, so I have now, it's guilt-free that I have stopped momentum because I didn't stop it. So it's funny, it's, it's a weird thing that every other time if it's someone goes, we've got a job for you, and anyone that's been in entertainment and worked from nothing to where we are, Comedians are, are very, very guilty of this wonderful thing, which is a work ethic. You know, I don't knock the gig back because next week, because I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm permanently unemployed. I mean, this is, you know, this part, this feeling of being unemployed is not a stranger to any person in entertainment. It's, it's terrible. The industry has stopped. We've lost our ability to, to. That there's not opportunity there, but the the feeling of going, I don't have a gig. <clears throat> it's permanent. Every time we finish a show, that's it. Your contract's done. Mm -hmm. Like we lose our job forty times a year. So, um, but this time I, I'm not allowed to try and find work for myself in the next few months. So that I have guilt-free momentum loss, but as soon as the shackles come off us and people are allowed to go out in crowds, um, you can guarantee I'll put fuel in the car and floor it. It feels like um, uh, your generation it was very much like the um, you know, men don't cry, you know, mental health didn't seem like it was a huge thing in 2020, how much have you evolved in regards to how you view things like your mental health? Yeah, it's, it's, it is very different. It's, um, I mean, everyone's heard this said a million different ways and a million times, but the, the world is, is more complicated to navigate. Um, uh, whenever someone says the good old days, I think sometimes that means simpler, simpler times. Um, also, um, uh, good old days, we all know, when, you know, between sort of, you know, for, for a lot of people, for people fortunate enough to have lived an enjoyable life, you know, sort of that, that 14 to 28, 26-year-old period is just awesome no matter what you're doing for, for, for a lot of people um, who are blessed with a, with a good life. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, look, the mental health thing, especially now, it, it's, look, I, you know, I, I'm a part of many organisations who, who who work in that area and... And it's like I said, life is just far more complicated now. There are there are more schedules, there are more things. If anything good comes out of anything good comes out of coronavirus, the, the one thing I th I'm hoping it is is that it's back to basics, which is um, food, water, um, shelter, um, and the love and comfort of those around you, be that family, friends, um, or otherwise. So I'm kind of hoping that resets that. I think it's going to make it tougher for many, many, many people. Not everyone's in the joyful situation that I am to be near family that, that they adore. Not everyone has that comfort. Um, but I do think the 2020, how much have I changed and evolved? Yeah, look, the, the, I've, I've had a lot of friends. Um, entertainment, um, unfortunately, has the highest suicide rate by three of any other industry on the planet. So they're horrible stats that I know, unfortunately, are too well. So I've, I've had to say goodbye to a lot of mates who've taken their lives in entertainment. So uh, it's it's not it's not a fad. It's not a phase. It's just the world is different now. And as I said, it's harder to navigate. So um, this are you okay is so 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 important. And now with coronavirus, man, I can we we know the answer to this. There's a lot of people who are not okay. So that's changed. I was from a generation who were like, come on. Up you get, get on with it. And it was, you know, sentences like, and I was raised by them. It doesn't matter if you get punched out. I, my dad was a boxing trainer. I did boxing. I was a sparring partner for 13 years. And the thing was, um, it doesn't matter if you get punched out. What you get judged by is how quick you get off the canvas. So that was that was the expression, which, which kind of means chin up, get up and get on with it. But 
not everyone can do that. Not everyone has the ability to do that. And and I think my parents' generation, I've had to talk to quite a few people, uh, the sort of generation above me or one or two above me, um, that go, oh, come on, it can't be that bad, just get on with it. I, they, they don't understand that it, it's it's not mm-hmm. a choice, that, that depression is not a choice. It's I can't choose my height um, and people can't choose... Um, whether they do are or are not depressed. They can try their best to try and navigate their way out of it, but that's what depression is, someone who can't find a way of navigating their way out of it, and they need help. And that. Um, and the first point of call for that is friends. Do you think that, like, the entertainment industry, there's a lot of pain in the process of achieving? Um, do you think people are drawn, you know, the statistic around people taking their lives and, and the types of people that get involved in doing this you know are you seeing a similarity in the types of humans that are involved in the entertainment industry and sort of that connection to mental health you know it's like um robin williams one of the funniest people on earth and one of the people that struggled the most on earth you know yeah Oh yeah, I've, got, I've, I've watched I've watched three projects with him in it in just the last week. He was uh, he was he was a you know an idol of mine without doubt. And you know I remember exactly like I remember exactly where I was when I heard that he was gone. The to answer your question, I I think we are uh, emotional beings. People in, in in the arts tend to be because um, art of any kind is emoting. Um, uh, and you know even if it's painting, it's expressing yourself. There's also, it is a long road. There is a lot of rejection. Um, entertainment, uh, if anyone, if you imagine a builder on a work site, if you're an actor and you do a performance, you're going to please a lot of people, but you are going to annoy a percentage of the audience. Just facts, just stats. And social media, they've got access to you. So you can give the performance of your life and pour your heart into it. And a, a rather large number of people are going to rip into you. And I don't, that, and that can be hard and that can take a toll on people. And as you heard me say, there's a, there's a long period of time right at the start when Josh said, you know, is there any security in this? I'm like, no. Um, and and I'm permanently unemployed. And, you know, it, it, some of that comes at a, at a toll. It, it does more than just sits in the back of your mind. It, it actually infiltrates your entire brain space and your whole body. But I'm not sure if people would know. An analogy I have, and it may sound unfair, but imagine if you're a builder <clears throat> and when you're building that house or when you finish building it and you stand in front of it and go, there you go, I built it. If 100,000 cars drove past while you were standing there very quickly, going, good on you, mate, nice house, good house, love the house, good house, that shit, you call that a house? I could build better than that. You're the worst builder I've ever seen. My mate reckons you're a wanker. Piss off, mate. Do another job. Imagine if they just all of a sudden went, what the hell is going on? And you go... <laughs> That's the so, all these things driving past and people yelling out the window. That's the social media analogy of what happens when you do a performance. So that can come at a toll um, because people are so vocal and for whatever reason, don't know what it is, but it's because we, you know, we put ourselves out there. But once you finish your performance, people and now it, it does tend to come with a lot of anger. It's like, how dare you give that performance? on the channel that I could turn off with the click of a button. It's like you've turned up in their house and insisted they sit down and watch your performance. They, some mm. some people, not everyone, get really involved. When I did Top Gear, man, I I can't even say that. I, and I got off really lightly. People, for the most part, liked it. But when I did Top Gear, I can't even tell you some of the things. I, I just can't say the words on this show or any show, really. Um, I think even in a biker's den, they'd probably go, dude, back off on the language. <laughs> like, I just can't tell you some of the stuff I had said about you because people didn't like what I looked like in a car of their liking. I don't know, different world. Yeah, look, Shane, I, I want to take this time. Uh, when you played Mackie in The Bourne Legacy, one of my favourite franchises, <laughs> One of my favourite characters, mate. Absolutely <laughs> nailed it, mate. Absolutely nailed it. I was, I was blown away when I saw you in there and I was like, mate, you have nailed nailed it. I've nailed Mackie. Yes, I, um, <laughs> my favourite story about um, Bourne Legacy, so for those listening who don't know, I played a very small role in one of the Bourne movies that was the one with Jeremy Renner, Bourne Legacy. But anyway, I, um, I was going through an airport once and this guy and a girl, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whatever they were, were <laughs> Walked up to me and the guy said, "Oh, you're that guy. You're that guy." I said, "Yep, I'm a guy." And he goes, "No, you were you were in that you were in that." And it, the girl was staring at. She had no idea who I was. 
I, I could see that clearly. And then he goes, you were you were in that thing. You are in that thing. And I'm like, because just so you know, if someone goes, um, uh, hey, you look for me, I never go, that's because I'm Shane Jagerson. Or um, do I know you from somewhere? You know, I usually say Australia's most wanted, but there's no way you, you go... <laughs> Or if they go, you look a lot like that guy, Shane Jacobson, I don't go, well, that's because I am. It's just, I think I'm going to get struck by lightning. So unless someone goes, <laughs> are you Shane Jacobson? But if, if they don't ask the right question, I, I just go, well, you know, I get, they go, you look a lot like that guy, that Kenny. I go, I get that a lot. Um, <laughs> because otherwise I'm, I've got, I'm almost turning them around to go, hey, stop. Don't you realize I am that guy? Like, so anyway, yeah. uh, so I, I must admit, I don't help them too much unless they know who I am because there's, Otherwise, it feels a bit braggy. But he goes, you, you were in that thing. You were in that thing. I said, yes, I've, I'm, I've been in some things. I've been in cars and cabs and been in debt, been in lots of things. <laughs> and he goes, no, nah, you, you're in that, you're in that, you're in that Bourne film. And when he said the Bourne film, his <laughs> wife or girlfriend had this look on her face like she'd been asked to, like, just eat a hat. I don't know what happened, like <laughs> lick, lick the back of a football or after a grand final or something. She had this weird face and he goes, not the one with Matt Damon. Who was it? And I said, it was Jeremy Renner. And his girlfriend or wife goes, oh, porn film. I thought she said porn film. <laughs> <laughs> it is still my favourite day on earth that some woman thought I was in a porn film. <laughs> I didn't correct her. <laughs> okay. Do you, um, the the whole thing? I've, you're, a, you're someone I think that's humble. The being known for for something. So say Kenny, for instance, you would be called out as Kenny. I'm sure still today. Yeah. Do you just do you just reconcile it? How has it changed over the last you know fifteen fifteen years? Your relationship oh. with it all. Um, the uh, yeah, people call me Kenny all the time, all the time, and I've always said, me and my brother have always said, it is so much better to be remembered for something you've done than forgotten for everything you've tried. Mm -hmm. um, and that is we will never turn our back. I, I, I do get a, a, a bit disappointed, if you will, for the want of better terms, when I hear actors kind of turn their back on, oh, that old thing, God, you know, because when they did it, it would have meant the world to them. And me and my brother and our family, when we were making Kenny, we, we would have given – we just wanted some people to see it and for them to enjoy it. And we poured our heart into that. And my brother worked tirelessly for two years and I toured for seven months in character, hoping an audience would get to see this film we've made and just hoping they'd think it was okay. And it went really well. And we I'm never going to forget how much we wanted that to work. And then how how – how much people enjoyed it. Like, that's fantastic, you know. If everything stopped after that, that still would have been enough. So it's funny when people go, Kenny, which I, you know, people yell out of cars and, you know, it still happens everywhere I go. Some people um, think my name is Kenny. Uh, my favourite is when they abbreviate it. Uh, so, Ken, question for you, mate. Uh, <laughs> I get that stuff all the time, and I don't go. Ah, oh, look, mate. I, and so many people say, it's "Look, Kenny, you probably don't mate. want to talk." <laughs> <Full name. laughs> it's Kenny, if you will. Is there but, a certain you know, place? Is there? Is do you notice? Like, if you go to an IGA, are you known as the IGA guy? Like, yeah. do you have to serve people? Do they do they think you're the store manager? <laughs> no, it's just kind of look at that. Kenny's in IGA. <laughs> <laughs> he looks a lot. <laughs> he looks a lot like the guy from the IGA ads. I get that a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Kenny and IGA, the one from the porn film. <laughs> <laughs> what, would, what would the porn uh, be called? Ken, Kenny's Revenge, plumbing from the wrong end. What would it be called? <laughs> yeah. It would be. We, we've spoken about on the show before. There is a bunch of parodies. Uh, on oh, free, porn like, and porn parodies, and I feel like uh, Kenny, there could be a good one. Have you gone through the names of the porn parodies? They're my <laughs> yeah. favourite. Saving Saving Ryan's Privates. Yeah, I love that one. <laughs> a bit of the, a favourite. Um, the The Australian film industry in general, how like as someone who is focused on the business side of things and having understanding of business. The Australian film industry, I guess, gets a, a lot of knocks of not being up to scratch. What's your perspective, having been in there? So we are, we are, we punch so far above our weight, and I'll tell you why. Um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of films made a year in America. Mm. 
And only a few get to cinemas for people to see. Australia don't make thousands and thousands of films. We'd be lucky to make a hundred, hundreds of them a year. And so many of them are good enough to watch. And we do it, we have a really small population. Everyone's heard of the million times, I'll fast track it. We don't have a big population, so we can't fill the cinemas like they can in America. And yet the product we make is fantastic. Look at how many Australians, look at per capita, how many Australians are hits in Hollywood. So our actors are fantastic. Our technicians are, are, are I know people say it, <clears throat> and when you hear it at, at like a Logies or whatever, you go, oh, they're just saying that they are actually world class. They, they, they are. That we, that we just are. And, and there's good reasons for it because um, in Australia, in America, you, you tend to focus on one particular thing and there's reasons for it. There's, there's unions that, that protect each person's job and, and that would be required in a, in a big population like that. But in Australia, everyone gets on with it. <clears throat> so, um, and I'm not saying which one is better or worse. I'm, I'm not judging either for either. However, the ups, upside is on a job in Australia, um, you know, people tend to know more about the art of filmmaking. So, you know, me and my, my brother can pull together two or three people and with me and him, we can come together and make a movie. I mean, we did. Kenny was made with about three of us. So mm. so we can we can have all those skills. And, you know, my brother, literally between me and my brother, we can pull together four or five people and make a movie. Um, mm. So there's that. But, look, it is... It, it's a t it's a very tough industry. I've always said getting a film up in Australia is like trying to raise the Titanic on a mouthful of air. Um, films are incredibly when someone goes, "Hey, I've got a great idea for a film." I go, "Hey, we've got hundreds of them. We just can't get them up. <laughs> just can't get them to screen." So it, it's it's an incredibly hard industry. And it, on average, if people want to know, on average, to get a movie from an idea to on a screen is pretty from the most part um, eight years. There are stories where it's been less, but for the most part, it'll be eight years. So if someone goes, I've got this idea for a movie, from that point, if they run the normal course that it would take, um, they are eight years away from it ever being on a screen. So when someone says, do you want to sit down? I've got this idea for a movie we should make. I go, are you ready to dedicate the next eight years of your life to it? And just so you know, that is no guarantee whatsoever that it'll get made. It is Ken, crazy. It's exciting. Oh, no, Kenny, um, uh, no, just that's a little dad joke. Um, in terms, like, I, I see you and your brother, it's almost like the the OG YouTubers that are just getting the camera, they're making it happen, they're doing all the bits. It's like you got those films made back in the day. And is there a difference now in terms of getting something made? I know you said eight years, but is there a, you know, the time's different, cameras are cheaper, mm. things are more accessible, there's more more content needing to be made for Netflix and streaming services. Are you actually, once you get the green light, is a film being done quicker than it was, say, 15, 20 years ago or 10 years ago? Yeah, so um, film and content will separate those because there's TV, that can happen fast turnaround. And you guys, I mean, you know, Josh... Josh can go out with all the gear he's got and all his knowledge and shoot something and have it have it on air in a week, you know. Um, so content is still king. This thing here, that their content is king um, because we're all walking around with televisions in our hands now and it never happened 40 years ago. Um, you know, the average family had one TV in their house if they had one when I was a kid, if they had one. And now, as we know, every pocket, you know, there's one out of four pockets on your jeans as a as a a viewing device in it and then you walk home and there's four TVs and three computers and five iPads. So I content wear cargo is pants, so I've got about ten screens. <laughs> <laughs> He's not joking. <laughs> <laughs> so content is still king. So you're right, it has changed from the point of view that content can get made faster now. But if someone wants to make a traditional let's just call it for now a traditional movie. So you know <clears throat> you know it's it's a three act uh, story, a start, middle and an end, a proper movie, let's call it an hour and a half with, you know, big scenes and everything else. That if you go, you want to make one that I, that's going to get shown in a cinema, um, having said that now, Netflix, as you know, now makes movies, they can do it faster. But <clears throat> but the difference with Netflix is they are they're funding and they are the distributor and the producers of their own product kind of thing. They go, mm -hmm. well, we're doing this. So they they can get it up quicker. Whereas what traditionally used to happen um, was a filmmaker or a writer would come up with a great script and then write it and then they've got to find a director and they've got to find the actors. So that, <clears throat> and then it's got to be rewritten and rewritten and everyone that gets involved that brings money and has a say over the script and then the world changes, they want to change the plot and then they go, actually that actor doesn't want to play it, we've actually got this actor, it'd be better if we change the characteristics of that actor or that, that character. So 
that model will take on average eight years. I did a film called uh, so Oddball. That was seven after I walked on set for that to start filming that. When I first got handed that script was seven years before that. So the script was already finished and it took seven years from that. Um, what ladies about like Brothers Brothers Nest, like your um, the film uh, you made with Clay. Is it was that a was that a different process? Very different, but that's my brother who's a freak yeah. who wanted to make another film and in the end had a lot of a lot of delays, distributors coming on board, people not not quite knowing who the audience was for it or how to get it funded and we couldn't get funding for it. And uh, in the end, my brother said, the only way to make something happen is to give yourself a deadline. And I'm not saying this will work for everyone, but he's a bit of a freak like this. And, and you know, there's a bit of an advantage that he's a, a director and our friend wrote the script and my brother and him worked on it. Um, and then me and Clay were going to executive produce it and we had producers and all that sort of stuff. And we knew the crew we wanted. And so we made sure the script was a one location script um, and my brother rang and I said, when have you got four weeks you can give me? And so we, it was 12 months out before I had a four week period that I could lock out and go, I can give you four weeks here. And he rang his producer, Jason Byrne and said, we are filming, um, in 12 months time. And here's the start date. And Claytus decided to work back from the date, but you, but we had a script then that was finished and we were, we had a way of doing that with my brother and me doing and, and a few close friends doing a lot of the work um, and, mm. you know, he got me a lot cheaper than other people yeah. get me and all that kind do of stuff. So, access, Do you get access to distribution though? Like if you go down that route, are you then, do you still have the doors open or do you have to go through the other process? So we did something, well, my brother came up with an idea that we'd never done before and I'm not sure it has been done before Clay did it, which was we actually did, we went around the distributors. Now, distributors have been great to us. Um, over the years without doubt. However, um, we actually, Clay came up with an idea for funding and distribution. We went away from distributors and we went away from the major cinemas, from all the majors, and we got independent cinemas to invest in the film. And for that, um, they got the film to play as often as they wanted, basically. And depending on how much they put in, that we would guarantee a premiere at their cinema where me and Clay turned up. And so the small independent cinemas invested in the movie and then they got the movie and it got shown at their cinemas. What it meant was it could never be a box office smash hit because um, it wasn't playing at Village and Hoyts. It, you know, it wasn't playing at the majors. So you couldn't get go down to your to most local cinemas and, or to most big cinemas and watch it. But what you could go to was independent cinemas and see it. Mm -hmm. So that was how we did that. And that was, so you're right, Josh, it, 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 we, we went completely around the entire model of how you would make a film and did it that way. And that's how we got it on screens in a year. Mm -hmm. And, and so you guys, what did you work out success being sort of at the end of that cinema run? What, what was the idea? And did you meet the success that you had in mind? God. Gee, that's a good question. Success, what's the measure of the success in that? So it, it's a few things because there is the, when you get the script right and you read it, that's one, we're going to call that a milestone. And yet, you know, my brother and Jamie Brown, who wrote it, my brother worked on it with him. Um, you know, you get to that and go, now that, that's ready. That's a shooting script now. That's not a draft. That's not a first draft, a second draft. And there can be, you know, 10, 15. By the time you get to the first day of shooting, there can be 15 drafts, 15 changes. And I don't mean just one line. I mean major changes. And so you get that, and that's for the for the writer. And that, that's, 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 that's a tick. You go, bang, that's, that's, that's success there. We've got a great script in our hand. So then you've got to get the, getting the film funded and getting to the point you go, okay, we're shooting this thing. That is another success because you've now got it. You know, I'll go back to motor car races. You can have a race car driver, but and there can be a car there, but until they get their major sponsor, that car is not going anywhere near a racetrack other than test. That's not going to race in anything. So when you get your major sponsor, that's a big bang, success. We're making this thing. Then you shoot the film, and when you finish, when you wrap, you go, oh, my God, we've just shot a film. Then they go away and have to do all the post-production, which is the editing and the sound mixing and the grade, and that can take forever. And when that's finished and you have your cast and crew screening, um, your first sort of cast and crew or your first audience 
test screening, when you sit there with an audience, then trust me, the director and the writer sit there and the producer with their heart in their mouth and they wait for the audience to react all the way through it. And if the audience behind them reacted the way they hoped they would or even near enough to that during that screening, then that is a huge success because they've just had an audience enjoy what they did. So if you wrote a song and you sat down in a room with five people and sung the song and all five of them cried mm. for a ballad that you wrote, you would go, that is what I wanted. So then you, that's a success right there. But then you've got to go for box office success. You've got to try and make your money back and you've got to try and pay your investors. And so there's that. And then once that happens, you want it to be, do you want it to be, a box office hit or do you want it to be a critically acclaimed movie or do you want it to be a cult hit or do you want it to be all of them? It's really hard to, to be all of them. Um, there's only, you know, one in a, not too many of those. There's they're, they're sort of one in 10,000 10, or something. What about the festival Probably. stuff? Like because um, you did a bit of the festival round with the film as well, didn't you? Yeah, so, so Brothers Nest got... There's a list there of one, what is it? The South by Southwest Film Festival 2018 official selection. It's on a, on a little poster up there. So it, it got accepted into a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, film festivals and, and applauded. Um, it played at South by Southwest, I think, twice, um, as, which, was, which was pretty awesome. So um, then after that, was it a box office success? No. No, it wasn't. So you go, in a way, you go, that's really disappointing. But then you read the write-ups about it and they're saying it's an awesome film. So, um, you know, at one point my brother's one of the only people to have had two films, which was between Kenny and Brother's Nest, that both at one point were 100% on Rotten Tomatoes um, or 99% or something, which was, but I think Kenny was 100 for ages and then um, one bad review came out, which gave Brothers Nest a, a big drop. But yeah, so, that, so to answer your question, the success, the success of that was all of those points when the script was right, when we got the thing funded, when we finished shooting it, when we did a casting crew and they loved it. And then, um, and, then and, and also every time you're in an audience with it and they, at the end, they, you know, they burst into applause or whatever they do, that yeah. when it's your own project, that, that does make you go, oh, that felt good. That felt good. Like the, that's a payment. That's a payment of sorts, you know. Is it unfair to, to look at the box office stuff as a success metric when you look at, say, Brothers Nest and Clay designing it in that way? Is there still that friction of the old school mindset being applied to this new way of doing things? Yeah, it is because the question is uh, who should you applaud louder, the person with the gold medal around their neck or if you found out there was a guy or a girl in Kenya that could run the race two seconds quicker than them, like like who's the winner in that? Mm. You know, that's the thing is 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 it – yeah, is it – the accolade around it. So, yeah, the box office, because here's the thing is the box office successes aren't the ones that necessarily win the Academy Award. In fact, quite often that's not the case is, you know, an art house film is not going to be, for the most part, a box office smash. So you can have a Ben Stiller film, for instance, that, that will just take massive dollars at the box office and everyone's going to enjoy it. But if someone says, so how would you compare that to, you know, one floor of the cuckoo's nest or something, well, someone's going to go, well, you don't compare those. Like, how does that compare to The Shining? You go, well, no, you can't compare those. And everyone goes, why not? They're yeah. movies. And you go, well, one's a racehorse and one's a donkey by comparison, you know. I mean, the blessing and the curse is that everyone is a uh, movie uh, critic writer now. Like, I, was, I got so annoyed reading all these sort of, like, people on Facebook, uh, and it was an article posted by just, you know, a junk media outlet talking about The Irishman, the Netflix film that was about three hours long. But, mm. I mean, these are some of the best actors in the business. And I thought it was amazing. I thought it held my attention for anything that can hold my attention for a long time <laughs> is, uh, I think, <laughs> pretty bloody good. And they, were, and they were amazing. But I, I just found myself getting so annoyed at these people who were just, like, slamming it as the as the professional critics themselves when it is so subjective. Do you think the time of a movie critic is on the way out based on things like Rotten Tomato and, you know, things that actually move the needle in terms of the population that have voted? Yeah, the, the film critic thing um, 
you know, there's one in particular in Australia who who just tends to hate most things he watches, and he's probably got the biggest voice. <laughs> um, in fact, my dad has said that uh, anything that this man hates, my dad wants to see because he disagrees <laughs> with him so much. <laughs> that that was what was so great about David and Margaret was they liked such different films. Um, and I thought they were a good, fair way of looking at some films. Not everyone would agree because... So Margaret Pomeranz loved Kenny and David d- really didn't like it. And we were okay, me, me and Clay were really okay with that. It's like, that's good. That that suggests this is going to be great for some people and not for everyone else. And But you, your question about film critics is... Uh, so some of, the, <laughs> some of the stuff I've had said about films I've been in, uh, here's some of me and Stephen Curry play a game of what's the worst thing that's been said about you in a, or about a film you've been in. Uh, so one was the search for the second worst film of the year is over. <laughs> <laughs> That's not too bad, actually. That's a great one. It's, That's a good one. Oh, it's the second worst. <laughs> yeah, the, this film, the plot in this film is like a fart in an elevator searching for a nose. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite poetic. Um, and I've, look, I've got films that when you're shooting, you go, I know the critics who will hate this film. And yet, it's exactly what's in this script and we're delivering exactly what this film promises to be. Well, I did a film called The Barbecue and I knew it would get slayed, slayed by the critics. It's called The Barbecue. It's not called Freeing the Enslaved Tribes of Judea. It's called <laughs> The Barbecue. <laughs> and if you're going in there expecting to come out there you know, blown away by, you know, the most incredible plot. I mean, stop. Um, yeah, Oddball, Oddball was loved by by families and children. And, you know, it's a true story. It's about a chicken farmer who puts his marema on and on to stop foxes killing penguins. That's the story. That's it. And guess what? It worked. Everyone thought it wouldn't work and it did. There you go. That's the story. That's the plot. But you know what? That, that, you, know, you know, I don't know if you know this, the shortest... Do you know the shortest Hollywood pitch in history? And apparently this is a true story. I can't confirm it, but apparently it is. Do you know the shortest Hollywood pitch ever? A guy walked into one of the heads of one of the major studios and said, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito, twins. And they went, we fucking love it. (laughs) That's not a plot. That's not anything. That's just... (laughs) They just know it's going to work on a poster. It's got Danny DeVito. Yeah. You look at the poster and go, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito, yeah. twins. That's funny. I'm going to watch it. So and that they was worked. one of the highest grossing films, wasn't it? He got like $20 million on a back-end deal, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I heard. He made, it's, yeah, his highest grossing S- film in the early days. Yeah. Snakes on a plane. <laughs> yeah. Do you think they made that for film critics? <laughs> <laughs> so true Shane exactly. I always love chatting I I always feel calm after we chat but also I want to say thank you because when I was uh, you know 19 or 20 years old I knew no one in the industry I did uh, some social media for Charlie and Boots and then we started working together and I just felt like you were the uh, the biggest celebrator of what I was doing but then also I'm never going to forget the Logies when uh, I was there behind the camera. Uh, Shane walks in, he's on the red carpet, pushes all the the celebrities to the side. Goes, Josh, he gives me a big hug. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> I appreciate all the, the support over the years. Mate, thank you, but uh, you deserve every bit of it. You are – well, there's the fact that my, I think my wife's obsessed with you, but there's that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> everyone I ever know that gets anywhere near Josh, I always go, he's the nicest guy. He's so incredibly capable. Like, you know, I mourned the day that you started getting so busy and everyone found out how good you are that I kind of I, – I had more access to you. And then everyone, like, you know, at the same time, Hamish, Andy, everyone's like, oh, my God, how amazing. And, like, we're all saying the same thing. Oh, my God, Josh is awesome. He's like, he is the nicest man on the planet. And then you're more than capable of everything you do. And then my greatest dissatisfaction was watching you succeed where you became less and less available. I actually came on this show just to say, go to hell, yeah. Josh. <laughs> retire from social media for a bit. I yeah, mean, yeah, that yeah. was... Shane, Shane, you told your brother you needed 12 months until you could find four weeks. Well, it's taken two years for Josh to find a spot for you, mate. <laughs> I've been sitting in front of this monitor for 12 months waiting for you to fit me into your goddamn schedule, Josh. <laughs> thanks, Shane. It's, oh, it's thanks, always great chatting, mate. Hey, awesome. Thank you, Thanks, and 
And also, yeah, thanks to all of you guys and thanks for the show you're doing and also thanks to all the wonderful listeners who, um, who, who you know, give a show like this. Um, it's time to get an audience because without an audience, kind of, we, we're kind of yelling into a shoebox um, pointlessly. Yeah. But um, I, I love the fact that the, this, this kind of realistic format where people are having a proper chat exists. So uh, thanks for everyone listening and thanks for you guys for doing it. It's been and my there's pleasure. There's a bunch of people you- in, in the chat too that are absolutely loving Having you Shannon, on, uh, Shannon yeah. said, um, you're utterly delightful, Shane. What a magic chat. Um, Rory says, uh, what a legend. Just needed this on a Wednesday morning. And uh, Jazza says, wow, you definitely need to write an autobiography. Well, he has. Yeah. This, is the, this is the, like, and I've, I've, got, the, I've got the copy, <laughs> of course. Love a good, love a good book. But um, no, it's no. great. I mean, you're a, you're a storyteller. I think that that's the thing. Like, you can, just you being... Uh, around a fire or something like that that's your like i feel like you need a podcast as well i feel like this is your element you could you know you've got stories for days yeah well it, um, it's so i've been uh, i've been asked a lot to do them and um and I've, there's this one that i'm looking at doing which i just want to do unsung heroes because um yeah the australia is filled with so many stories of we know all the celebrities the celebrities get mm-hmm. celebrated too much I, I think and i've always found it amazing that you know celebrities get discounts on stuff and single mothers pay full price like it's always confused me it just should be they should just go are oh, you an actor well that's 200 percent more um <laughs> well it feels when like the, the government- coronavirus stuff is changing all that like when we start seeing the essential workers and and that type of thing that that seems to be changing it yeah I, I think it'll reset some stuff and i think some of it does need to be reset you know but i but yeah the, to go back to the podcast thing yeah i this this it's funny i keep I, I do love you know my dad's a great storyteller he's the best i'll ever meet and um and, and the funniest man i've ever been near and and he's a raconteur you know that's the old term he's he's a great storyteller and in this time of coronavirus my brother's actually got him um at his place looking after him dad's 85 now and so my brother's filming my dad um his entire life story he sits down every day for about an hour with the cameras on him and has this amazing lighting set up where it's just dad's head that's lit and in the studio my brother's got at his property and he's filming my whole dad's st- life as story and I keep watching him and me and my wife keep crying, you know, and laughing and every other emotion in between. But, um, yeah, so storytelling is a thing I celebrate and I do think there are um, the unsung heroes of Australia. You go and get, you know, people that work on cattle stations and sit them down and talk to them and they make us look shit ass because mm-hmm. they are, yeah. they're properly, you know, for what I celebrate, the Australian storyteller. So uh, I'm tempted, Josh, I'll have you, yeah. you guys can tell me how to do it because, Josh, yeah. you were the man that used to teach me how to look after my tech before you deserted looking me. At, but look at you now, you've got your, I'm sure your iCloud's all backed up and fucking the amount of... <laughs> The amount of time trying to work out your iCloud password. You know? <laughs> Just before you boot me off your show, tell everyone how long it took us to get this shit sorted with oh, me actually, at my Actually, it wasn't end too bad. I was impressed. I was a... I was definitely uh, reminding myself of moments. I was like, maybe I should have just gone, gone there and set it up for you. But no, it was actually <laughs> fine. You handled it very well. You're, you're a bit like me. I feel like we're similar. You, you want to get things right. And yeah. so yeah. there's the whole he's, he's thing. He's also of, a great actor, Josh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just, keep, just keeping, it, keeping it together. But also, Shane, I think the other thing too is that spotlight on the stories and exactly what you're doing uh, with the Westgate Bridge story. It's an important story that needs to be told yeah. in Australian history. And otherwise, if these stories don't get told, mm. they get lost. Um, Shane, just on that, I remembered when I was a kid, mum... Uh, told me about the Westgate Bridge falling down and she told me that w- she worked in the city and she heard it fall down that day. She could hear it, it, it from the city. It's- it shook Melbourne. It um, mm. So, yeah, look, there's some stats around it. The reason I'm... Uh, so um, jo- there's people who rode that thing to the ground and survived it. But some terrible... St- there's so many terrible stories. So the men that worked on that bridge had to spend um, two days helping pull their mate's body well bodies or to be a bit graphic body parts because a lot of them weren't complete out of the the mud that was the the, the that is the, sort of that that part of the banks of the the area there and um and then as soon as they finished spent i mean it just wouldn't happen today you wouldn't have people on a work site where they've just watched their 35 of their mates die around them and then stay there for two days actually pulling the bodies out to rescue them and as soon as they did that they got one day off and then they were fired without pay mm-hmm. And you just go, what? And you go, oh, yeah. So the Westgate Bridge Collapse was actually um, pretty much the start, the impetus of WorkSafe. So um, wow. WorkSafe didn't exist until before that, and that was one of the things that kick-started WorkSafe, you know. Even Johnny Secker, who's obviously a, 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 a 
one of the people that's on the front page of the paper a lot, he's the head of the CFMEU, he's a, a union man and he's a, 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 a sort of one of those figures that creates controversy um, in the papers and in roundtable conversations. His father worked on that bridge and rode it to the ground and survived but watched all of his mates die. And, I, and you know, that's one of the reasons I think why Johnny Secker's family are so hell-bent on unions and trying mm. to keep a safe workplace. Now, um, whatever people think of that, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm not trying to lecture anyone on any part of that, but just fascinatingly, Johnny mm. Secker's father was one of the men on that bridge and he rode it to the ground and survived it, but 35 of his mates didn't. And, in fact, he was saved by smoking, which is the weirdest story. He walked out of the lunch hut that was on top of the bridge, walked out, lit up a smoke, and that's why he was on a part of the bridge that he still rode to the ground, but his mates will perish. So he was saved by cigarette smoking. So there you go, kids. Mm -hmm. Not that bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, is, so Shane, have you got? So you've been working on the doco. Has it got like a re like release date and things like that, or what's that? So we're happening? believe it or not, I'm still I'm self funding this. Uh, if mm -hmm. everyone thinks it all comes easy, we're we're, we're hoping to get it to a, a free to air network. We're, we're talking with, uh, with networks now, so I still don't have it funded. Um, mm -hmm. I've spent quite a lot of my own money on it because um, I, I promised the families um, years ago. Um, and Josh, Josh, you would know this, mate, because you, you, before you deserted me, um, you went and filmed the memorial service for me yeah. a couple of times, didn't you, mate? Mm, and, yeah, yeah. Um, so you know how long I've been on this. What's it mm. been, you know, four yeah, years now? it's been now. four or five years, like, yeah, starting to get all the... But also the other thing too is these stories, if uh, the people who did survive, they pass away and things like that. So it, it is that mm. importance of getting it done... Um, but if we know anything, stories. guys, eight years, eight years it takes. Yeah, eight years. So you told got us what, that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, <laughs> and so, um, and so with the, are you in post product? Like, are you still filming interviews and stuff like that? So we've finished all the interviews. We've, um, they're all done, and uh, and so now we've just got to wait for the for which network uh, says yes to go mm -hmm. ahead because we will then access their archival libraries, and of course it depends on which network you end up with as to what what footage you get access to. Um, to, to gain, to purchase uh, footage, archival footage is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we want to partner up with a, with a network. So um, I have a, another company, which is a, a documentary making company uh, with myself and a lady called Ariel White. And um, it's called Had To Be Told Productions. So stories that we think have to be told. And we've partnered up with um, WTFN. So <clears throat> they do shows like The Living Room and, and Bondi Vet and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, we, we've teamed up with them for us to all work on this together. So we've shot the interview We've actually we just we've just finished editing the sizzle reel this week, and um, and there's a treatment that's going to all the networks, and we hope to have an answer in the next four to six weeks because we want it on air um, on uh, in the week and preferably on the night of the fifteenth of October, so it is the actual anniversary that this show airs on. Mm -hmm. Great, Amazing. awesome, Shane. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Say hi to Fliss and the kids, and uh, <laughs> we'll go, do. Go back to um, yeah. What are you going to do now? What's 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 on for the rest of your day? Uh, so home, uh, we're doing some more homeschooling. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to go outside where my wife by now will probably have set fire to herself rather than try and teach these kids anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got to go outside and do a couple of um, a couple of assignments with the kids, um, and then um, I have to go and mix some mortar, <laughs> some sand and um, concrete mixed together to put between some pavers to finish off a small job, and uh, and we're finishing off our insurance policy for our. FTA Transport and Logistics Trucking Company um, before I have uh, three Zoom meetings. As we know, that's the way the world operates now um, to do with some productions and a tour I'm putting together. So, yeah, and I'm going to so have a nice uh, quiet one. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have a toasted sandwich in about two minutes. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. It's, it's the Daily yeah. Talk Show. Uh, if you would uh, like to watch live, you can do that at youtube.com forward slash the Daily Talk Show. This is a podcast as well, so you can listen on your favorite podcast app. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you at 4 p.m., guys. Have a good one. See you, guys.